Um, Happy New Year and welcome to the first uh, of our series of lectures for winter 2018, the Geriatric Healthcare Lecture Series. My name is Barbara Cochran. I am an Associate Director with the Northwest Geriatrics Workforce Enhancement Center, affectionately known as the Northwest GWEC. And um, you'll be seeing me each week if you haven't seen me in previous times. I do want to remind the site coordinators um, and the people attending to make sure that you fill out a profile form. Only one profile form needs to be filled out. It covers the whole series, but there's also evaluations um, to fill out for each lecture, and you should have a copy of that as well as a copy of the handout, um, the uh, printed copy of the PowerPoint slides. Also, I want to let you know that the lectures that we're recording will be posted on our Northwest GWEC website within about 48 hours of um, when they're presented. And so you can look for that. Go to nwgwec.org and um, then uh, just look for the um, lecture series. I can't remember what the drop downs are, but you can figure it out. It's pretty self-explanatory. And it will be posted there pretty prominently. Um, and today, I'm very happy to introduce to you a great colleague, Manu Sacro. Um, she is a postdoctoral research fellow at Kaiser Permanente, Washington, used to be known as Group Health, um, with a program of research in chronic geriatric pain and policy initiatives to reduce risks associated with long-term opioid therapy. She has spent almost 10 years in clinical practice as an advanced registered nurse practitioner and currently works at Harborview Medical Center as the medical respite program, in the medical respite program for mostly homeless patients who've recently been discharged from the hospital. Manu did her PhD training in nursing at the University of Massachusetts, Boston, and we're very privileged to have her here now in Washington State. Welcome. Thank She's going to be talking with you today about an incredibly important topic, new guidelines for opioid prescribing. Thank you for that nice introduction, Barbara. Uh, so, yes, yeah, so today, uh, I'm going to be talking about um, uh, opioid prescribing and uh, specifically talking to you more about older adults and um, the new guidelines for opioid prescribing and what that means um, uh, for older adults specifically. So just to give you a little bit of a background, if you haven't already heard about um, uh, the national epidemic, as it were, of um, uh, opioid uh, overdose and um, this is a result of the increase in opioid prescribing that's occurred um, uh, from the late 1990s up until today. Um, this graph just shows you from um, from 2000 on um, how the rates of opioid prescribing have been ex increasing exponentially. And this graph um, is representative of the overdose deaths. So um, uh, the red line here represents um, overdose related to prescription opioids. Um, and I want to make that um, a distinction clear. There, this um, uh, red line graph here, it, it represents prescription opioids and not um, heroin overdose deaths. So as you can see here, even prescription opioids um, uh, have uh, greatly increased um, the number of fatalities related to overdoses. And I know what you must be saying to yourselves, well, older adults, they have all these risks associated with opioids. They have reduced uh, metabolism, which increases their risks for toxicity. So um, maybe older adults aren't affected by these trends in, in opioid prescribing. And that is not the case. This um, uh, graph here um, is from 2013 uh, from uh, eight different states. And the last bar here, uh, the last bar, let's see if I can, here we can see on each, um, in each of the states represents those um, people who are older than 65. So um, although 
people who are middle aged from 45 to 64 um, do sort of top the age groups in terms of um, opioid prescribing rates. Um, people older than age 65 are not um, far behind. And this is um, actually pretty astounding because it is opioid prescribing rates per 1,000 state residents. So um, these aren't people who have pain, they aren't patients, they are just people um, living in the state. Um, and uh, you, as you can see here, um, you know, in Louisiana, let's say, uh, between 14 and 1,600 uh, uh, prescriptions per 1,000 state residents in the year 2013. This um, is representative of uh, Part D um, uh, Medicare data. So um, as some of you might know, Medicare is the public insurance program that covers people who are older than age 65 or collecting Social Security. And Part D is the specific part of Medicare that covers prescription drugs. And um, Medicare covers both people who are older and people with disabilities, but the relationship is about 80-20, the last time I checked. So about 80% of people on Medicare um, are older or the age of 65 and 20% represent um, people with disabilities. So just to get that um, clear, here you can see that from 2006 to 2014, there's been an increase in um, uh, the number of uh, beneficiaries, which represents the sort of aging demographic shift that we all know of. Um, this second line here represents spending for all drugs. And then the red line here represents spending for um, commonly abused opioids, which in this case I think is oxycodone, hydrocodone, uh, morphine, drugs like that. And um, as you can see here, that spending has increased, which we expect because the number of beneficiaries increased, but the spending for opioids is, is even higher. So part of this increase in spending is being driven by this um, uh, spending for, for commonly abused opioids. So why do we need prescribing guidelines? Well, um, previous guidance around opioid prescribing were really inconsistent. There was no um, standardized sort of message. A lot of the recent guidelines were older. They didn't necessarily represent the more recent evidence that we have today. Um, so as a result, there was a need for clear, consistent recommendations. And so the CDC um, uh, uh, released um, these most recent um, uh, guidelines for prescribing for opioids, and this is specifically for chronic pain. Um, so these were released in March um, of 2016. And since that time, many states have sort of taken on the CDC guideline as sort of uh, the gold standard or uh, the standard of care that all um, practitioners um, should be should be following. And I'll talk about that more um, in a bit. So these guidelines were both published um, in the MMWR, which is a journal um, put out by the CDC, as well as um, in JAMA that was uh, released at the same time. Um, so again, the purpose of this um, and the primary audience was really our, for primary care providers in outpatient settings, um, treating patients who are adults, and, and chronic pain in this case they defined as pain longer than three months or past the time of normal tissue healing. And they specifically do not include people who are um, actively being treated for cancer, palliative care, or end-of-life care. Um, so again, these um, guidelines were specifically for outpatient primary care um, providers. The, the recommendations are um, grouped into three categories with um, 12 specific points. So um, I'm going to go through the 12 points because I think they're really important. And I'm also going to point out how these points are uh, a departure from what we used to do. So um, uh, it sort of marks a shift in um, how we are thinking about opioids um, and treating chronic pain. And the three, uh, the three categories 
um, for the recommendations were when to initiate um, or discontinue opioids, how to select the right opioids, when to follow up, and then um, how to um, assess risk and address the harms um, that come with potential um, opioid use. So um, when, let's take this off. So um, determining when to initiate or um, continue. Uh, the first recommendation here is that opioids are not the first line therapy. That, in fact, non-pharmacologic and non-opioid pharmacologic therapy are preferred for chronic pain. Um, and this is a bit of a departure um, uh, from what we used to do, um, which was consider opioids to be the standard um, uh, of care, which is why um, I showed you at the beginning the, the graphs of the increased um, prescribing rates. So right off the bat, first recommendation not to use opioids as first-line therapy and only really consider it if the expected benefits um, are meant to outweigh any risks to the patients. And then if opioids are used, to combine um, opioids with non-farm um, types of methods or non-opioid um, medications as appropriate. The second recommendation here is to um, establish and measure progress. So again, you would think that this was already part of our standard of care, but in fact, this is a bit of a departure. And the way that it is a departure is this focus on function. So um, uh, prior to this, we were all really focused on pain relief. How much pain are you in now? We give you an opioid. Then what is your pain after that? Um, and this recommendation suggests that instead of, of looking at pain severity or pain relief, what we really should be focused on is function and maintaining function and improving function. So before even initiating opioid therapy um, for chronic pain, the recommendation is to determine, first of all, um, use a metric to actually um, measure the effectiveness and set the expectations for the patient on how you are going to be assessing effectiveness moving forward in the treatment plan. And the treatment goals, again, around pain relief and function. And um, the recommendation for a brief tool is uh, the PEG scale, which is three items. It's a 0 to 10 rating, with which most people are familiar with. Um, it's for pain on average, for how much pain interferes with your enjoyment of life, and how much pain interferes with your general activities. And the idea is that you um, look at all three of these um, items, and you could either sum them and take an average of all three, or you could look at each one individually um, and assess how the patient is doing um, on whatever treatment they are being provided for chronic pain. So the third recommendation is to discuss the benefits and harms. Um, and again, this might seem intuitive that any treatment that carries risks with it should um, invoke, in fact, a, a frank discussion about the benefits and harms. But in reality, a lot of times, you know, with the pressures that primary care providers are under, these kind of discussions will take a backseat to other things that they think are more important to cover in the short amount of time that they have with the patient. So the recommendation here is to really sit down and discuss the benefits and harms and be explicit and realistic about both the expected benefits and the patient's responsibility to manage their own treatment. So, you know, to be open and honest with patients about the increased risks of overdose at higher doses or when um, opioids are taken with other drugs or alcohol um, so that the patient understands um, all of uh, uh, the harms associated um, with the treatment. 
Also, it's important to talk to the patient about the periodic reassessment that they need to do in order to continue being on treatment, that they might have to do um, a urine drug screening in the future, um, that um, PDMP um, stands for Prescription Drug Monitoring Program, which I'll talk about a little bit later. Um, but it just basically represents that any patients who are being uh, prescribed opioids from multiple providers, that, that, that their primary care person will be able to check on that. And also talking to them about the risks to family members and individuals in the community um, for when and if they share their medications. So this is something that we normally have, have not done in the past, which is to say explicitly, do not share your medications with other people. These medications are dangerous. They should only be used for you and no one else. Um, uh, so the recommendations are very clear uh, to be explicit about those. All right, so how do we select an opioid? Um, or, and how do we determine what dose, when to follow up, and when, when should we discontinue? So, um, uh, well, the first sort of recommendation under this category is to avoid extended release opioids. So, extended release opioids are any opioids that um, last a sort of a longer time. So, they um, typically would represent a medication that you would take less frequently. Um, so, maybe a medication you would take um, once a day or twice a day versus a medication, let's say, that you'd take every four hours. Um, so medication that you take only once or um, twice a day would be long-acting or extended-release um, opioids. And the reason for um, um, avoiding the use of these medications is that um, because they are longer-acting, um, toxicity can build up in your system. So they're not metabolized as quickly. So therefore, people are at higher risk, right, for developing um, a toxicity, higher toxicity levels and then having overdose or other adverse events associated with higher toxicity. So in older adults, that could mean, you know, um, falls or injuries or um, uh, delirium or confusion. There could be a lot of problems associated with um, um, uh, extended release opioids or increased drug toxicity for older adults. So in general, not just for older adults, the recommendation is to avoid extended release um, medications. Um, and then specifically, they mention methadone. Um, and in particular, because methadone is in fact a, requires a lot of monitoring. So methadone is associated with some EKG changes. And there's no way to tell unless you periodically, you know, do EKGs on your patients to make sure that these changes don't occur. So um, there's a lot of responsibility that goes with a prescription like this, both on the provider end and on the patient's end, to do all of this monitoring to make sure that these kind of adverse um, uh, effects don't happen. And then, um, uh, finally, this I, they also pulled out this idea of, of, of transdermal fentanyl, which is now becoming a even bigger problem than it has in the past um, because of the relative potency of fentanyl in relation to other types of opioids. It's very potent. So um, that means that it's much easier to overdose on a medication that is very potent. So the recommendation is to only prescribe it if you're familiar with the dosing and you have a particular expertise um, or experience that you can rely on that will help you to um, uh, safely prescribe this medication to your patients. Um, but really, it's, it's not a, it should not be routinely prescribed. Okay, so number five is to avoid high doses. So this was the real kind of controversial um, recommendation. 
that was put out by the CDC that faced the most sort of um, um, uh, argument, right? Um, which was this idea of 90 um, MME here. Let's see if I can get this back. So MME stands for um, um, milligrams of morphine equivalents, which is basically a way of standardizing all different kinds of opioids um, uh, on a level where we can compare their potency. So, you know, like comparing a fentanyl to a Percocet or an oxycodone, right? By using these um, morphine equivalents, what we can do is we can break it down so that um, we can compare all the opioids on the same level um, so that it, it's, a, it's a fair relative um, uh, comparison of the potency. So something like Percocet would, be, would have a, less, um, a, a lower number compared to fentanyl, which would have a higher number. So um, again, the biggest sort of controversial thing was this idea of a dosing threshold. And a dosing threshold was basically a level of dose that they say that above that is considered high risk or um, uh, high risk for overdose or other adverse events like addiction. Um, uh, and so they set this at 90. Um, and, you know, part of the CDC guidelines were, in fact, um, uh, inspired by some of the guidelines that we started here in Washington State um, a few years ago. And um, the guidelines that were implemented in Washington State started out at 120 um, uh, morphine equivalents. But the CDC decided to um, reduce that number to 90. And that was based on all of the evidence review that they had done on um, uh, overdoses and the dose-dependent relationship between being on a higher dose and having an overdose. So this was the dosing threshold that was set. And um, along with the dosing threshold um, is this idea that um, patients um, who are not experiencing benefit from a lower dose should actually instead be tapered off of treatment. This is a huge departure from what we used to do. So what we used to do was we give an opioid to a patient and um, they're not doing as well or maybe they do well for a little while and they come back and they say, oh well, my pain is worse or my, my pain isn't getting any better. So then the, traditionally the response was to increase the dose. We have totally flipped it on its head at this point. Totally 180, that is not what we do currently. That is not the current recommendation. The current recommendation is actually to taper the patient off of the opioid rather than increasing the dose. And again, this is related to um, the risks associated with high dose therapy. Um, so what do we do with patients who are already taking um, high dose therapy? Well, the recommendation is to reevaluate the patient's um, uh, risks and benefits um, and you know discuss with them the recent evidence that's um, uh, come to light and consider a, a tapering plan. Um, this is also a more controversial um, uh, point of, of the recommendations. Um, and again, the main argument against this was that if um, limits are put on prescribing or doses, that uh, patients who have chronic pain, who rely on opioids to uh, improve their quality of life, that it would reduce their access and negatively impact patients who have chronic pain who really need opioids to maintain their quality of life. So that was like the real argument against um, uh, uh, these recommendations. Um, and like I said, it's a huge departure from what we used to do. This is um, also a uh, new um, recommendation, which is this, not only are we limiting the dose, but we're actually going to limit the supply. So in two ways, right? So, so 
um, acute pain prescriptions are now going to be limited to a three-day supply. So um, perhaps maybe in the past you could sprain your ankle or stub your toe or something and, and go to an urgent care or an emergency department um, and get maybe a week's worth of medication. That is, not current, that is not the current recommendation. The current recommendation is to restrict um, any um, opioid prescriptions for acute pain to, to a three-day supply. And again, this is all based on their evidence review that they did um, at, at the CDC. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about you know, the limitations of that evidence. Um, uh, but Again, this is the this is the current recommendation. Um, so for follow up, how often are we supposed to follow up? Well, patients um, are encouraged to follow up at least every three months. And at the beginning, when initiating therapy, that they should really be followed up within the first month. Um, and at every uh, reassessment, um, it's important to determine whether, you know, you're meeting your treatment goals and, and whether the benefits outweigh the risks at each point um, of reassessment. And also being tuned into sort of early warning signs where um, patients might be experiencing problems with opioids. So maybe requesting early refills or, um, um, again, frequent kind of requests for escalating doses. Um, this could be signs um, that the patient is having difficulty managing their prescription um, of opioids. So um, again, it's important to be aware of those um, warning signs. And so again, another uh, uh, sort of dose threshold here they set, which was uh, 50 morphine um, uh, uh, milligrams of morphine equivalents, which is that when initiating patients, um, uh, that you could escalate a dose up until 50, and if a patient is not experiencing any relief benefit to both pain and function, again, it's pain and function, um, that um, that medication should in fact be tapered off or discontinued because higher doses than that represent a higher risk and um, it might not actually um, be worth the benefit um, uh, because the risk is so high. And then if patients are taking concurrent benzodiazepines, which are um, medications when combined with opioids, um, actually work synergistically to depress the respiratory system. So benzodiazepines and opioids can work together on the central nervous system. And what it can do is it can um, depress your respiratory system. Um, and, and by taking the two together, you sort of compound that effect. So people who are on benzodiazepines should really be sort of tapered off of benzodiazepines and either switch to something else or reconsider the treatment plan so that you're not prescribing both of them at the same time. Um, and again, being um, proactive about tapering um, opioids um, or um, coming down off of opioids when patients experience an overdose or a serious adverse event, or like I said, um, you noticing the warning signs where uh, patients um, might be experiencing problems with their opioid use um, um, akin to addiction. And the recommendations were very clear, um, and I want to be very clear about um, this idea of tapering patients down. Um, I think that there is some misconceptions out in the, um, you know, in the sort of practice environment that patients who are unable to manage their opioid prescriptions should somehow be cut off from treatment. Um, and that is actually a very dangerous thing to do um, because you will throw the patient into crisis and really you know, the responsible thing to do is to give patients a taper plan to um, help them decrease the dose slowly so that the withdrawal symptoms are 
you know, not as, you know, pronounced as, as they might be if you sort of cut them off. And, and to give them appropriate treatment for withdrawal symptoms that they might experience or that you expect them to experience. So what about assessing the risks and addressing the harms? Well, um, uh, it's important to sort of evaluate the risk factors um, associated with overdose. And part of this um, recommendation is to incorporate strategies that are called um, risk mitigation strategies. And um, um, one of the risk mitigation strategies is to avoid prescribing to patients who already have a, um, a risk for respiratory depression. So patients who have um, moderate or severe um, sleep apnea are already experiencing some level of um, uh, decrease oxygenation at night when they're sleeping. So it um, increases her risk for overdose, as well as patients who have renal or hepatic insufficiency. So um, reduced kidney or liver function. And this is typical of older people. Um, when you're older, your metabolism is not as strong as it is when you're younger. So um, uh, the recommendation is that in fact, anyone over the age of 65 is actually considered a higher risk patient um, because of the potential um, for renal or hepatic insufficiency. And before initiating any kind of treatment, it's important to assess um, the patient's um, uh, function. And then to ensure that treatment for depression is optimized. This is a really big sort of piece of treating chronic pain. So we know that depression is commonly comorbid with chronic pain and that opioids actually produce this sort of transient anti-anxiety effect. And, you know, patients who experience this kind of um, uh, effect, this sort of anti-anxiety effect might, you know, it, it doesn't last. And so increasing the dose or continuing the treatment doesn't actually um, um, sustain that. So it's really, really important that, and obviously opioids are not the right treatment for anxiety or depression. So really important to um, treat comorbid depression We um, prescribe, so we can prescribe it to patients. So, really, should be prescribed whenever anyone is getting an opioid. Is to just prescribe naloxone to patients, especially patients who have history of overdose or substance use disorder. Um, anybody who is also taking a, a CNS depressant or um, patients who are on higher doses. So um, PDMP, what is a PDMP? Um, a PDMP is um, called a Prescription Drug Monitoring Program. And basically, it's an electronic database that tracks controlled substance prescriptions within the state. And um, a lot of states are using PDMPs. I think, I don't think that all states have currently um, um, uh, adopted it, but the 
plan, I think, is for all states to have a PDMP. And as an opioid prescriber, before there was a PDMP, yes? Oh. Do you think we could go back to uh, now, now Oxone? Oh, Naloxone, yes. Naloxone, sorry. That's okay. Go over that real quick. Oh, sure. Um, uh, so, rewind. Um, uh, <laughs> right. So, Naloxone is really important. Like, Naloxone is a life saving medication, and, and it's really important that um, patients who are getting opioid prescriptions also get a prescription for naloxone um, because it can be easily administered intranasally. Um, and honestly, I think that it should be treat, you know, everybody should learn it in CPR and everybody should learn it in basic life support. And, you know, everyone and anyone should learn how to administer the medication um, and that it should be widely available because it is life saving. And there are so many people who are dying every day as a result of. Um, opioid overdoses. So um, if you know of anyone who has an opioid prescription and they do not have naloxone in their home or on hand, it's very important that you stress to them to get a prescription from their provider just to make sure that they have it in their home. Um, if for some reason um, they experience an adverse effect, it'll be there and it's life-saving. Okay, so now on to the PDMP. So um, prescription drug monitoring uh, program is an electronic database run by the state. Um, and as an opioid prescriber, I can sort of um, go online at the um, uh, Department of Health website and get to the PDMP and look up my patients to see um, all of their prescriptions for controlled substances. So it'll tell me um, their prescriptions, uh, who prescribed them, um, and where they were filled. And all of that information will be readily accessible to me um, so that I can, in fact, responsibly prescribe opioids. So prior to having this PDMP, um, people like me who were very um, uh, you know, detail-oriented, I guess, or very aware of the risks associated with opioid use, would actually have to get on the phone and call the pharmacies in the area to find out how many prescriptions were being filled by each patient and who they were getting filled by. Um, and it takes a lot of time and a lot of effort. So this is really, um, you know, an amazing thing that will hopefully improve um, the, the safe opioid prescribing behaviors of, of providers and also reduce um, the kind of, it also reduce patients getting prescriptions, multiple prescriptions from multiple um, providers at, at all different pharmacies. The, that's the idea is to, to, um, to curb that kind of behavior and to improve safety. Um, so regular urine drug testing. So the recommendation is for at least annually to assess for prescribed drugs as well as other controlled substances um, in urine drug testing. So urine drug testing is also a bit controversial. And the reason is because they're a pretty imprecise um, in the sense that you can get a lot of um, false negatives, there, you know, there can be uh, problems in interpretation. Um, so, you know, urine drug testing is what it is. It's it's one piece of evidence that you could use to kind of create a picture, but to base your clinical decision making solely on a urine drug test, I don't think is the appropriate um, use of this kind of information. Um, and again, it's important to, to sort of before ordering the test to talk to the patient about why you're doing the testing, explain what you expect the results to be, and then ask the patient if you, um, if there are, there might be any unexpected results. And uh, patients uh, will often just tell you um, about what 
they expect will be in their urine so that you can have a frank uh, conversation with them about different substances that they might be using. So um, um, just even bringing it up can sometimes open that um, line of communication. And also not to test for substances that won't affect the patient management. So again, this isn't about controlling the patient's life or all of their life decisions. It's about um, maintaining safe opioid treatment um, um, for the patient. And again, like I, as I was saying, um, uh, tests need to be verified um, before you can actually really sort of make any kind of clinical decision making and 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 also not to dismiss patients um, based on 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 urine drug testing because like I said there uh, the measures has um, can be quite imprecise so this I've talked about um, already a few times which is to avoid uh, prescribing opioids with benzodiazepines um, and these medications are frequently prescribed together and have been frequently prescribed together for a very long time. So again, this is a huge paradigm shift for a lot of prescribers um, and primary care providers to think about these two medications as um, a, a serious interaction. And um, benzodiazepines are often used to treat insomnia or anxiety, but um, again, combined with opioids, um, increases the risk for respiratory depression. So what is the recommendation? Well, the recommendation is if you want to continue the opioid therapy to taper off of the benzodiazepines and use other kinds of medications or treatments for anxiety um, or insomnia. And this um, uh, will often result in sort of coordinating care with mental health professionals might be a good idea to bring them in um, uh, to help manage the patient, um, especially if you are deciding to switch um, medications that patients might have been using. And also to be very careful about um, patients who've been taking benzodiazepines for a very long time. Um, uh, uh, withdrawal from benzodiazepines can cause um, life-threatening seizures. So you have to be very careful about um, tapering people off of benzodiazepines um, and um, you know, definitely bring in some help if you need it, if you, if you aren't familiar with how to, how to do that safely. Treatment for opioid use disorder. This is a really um, important um, piece that uh, is now being sort of, prior to now, primary care providers uh, were not treating addiction um, in outpatient settings. But the recommendation now is for all primary care providers to be certified buprenorphine prescribers. And buprenorphine or suboxone is a medication that's used um, uh, to treat opioid use disorder. Um, and anyone who um, uh, is a prescriber can um, uh, apply for um, uh, this certification. And um, then be licensed to treat opioid use disorder. And really, because of the prevalence of this problem, uh, the recommendation is for all uh, primary care providers. And there are certainly a lot of um, residency programs uh, now that are actually requiring um, that all um, graduating um, residents actually uh, become um, uh, certified um, uh, buprenorphine prescribers. So again, offering and being aware of the treatments that are available in your community or in um, uh, the patient's community or that are accessible to the patient um, instead of, you know, perhaps in the past, um, uh, you know, putting the problem of addiction outside of the realm of the primary care provider. Um, uh, the current recommendation is that it's a medical problem like other medical problems and that primary care should be um, able to provide a treatment for this, um, uh, for opioid use disorder. Okay, so in summary, we have the three um, uh, categories here. 
Um, when do I start and when do I stop? Um, well, first thing, opioids, not the first line. Making sure that we're measuring the progress, right? So setting the expectations for the patient and um, looking at both pain and function. Openly talking about harms and benefits with the patient and their responsibilities to manage safe uh, treatment. Um, and then the second category here, how do I choose which opioid and when do I follow up? Avoiding extended release opioids, um, avoiding high dose therapy, reducing the supply for acute pain to only three days, and then following up at least every three months with patients who are being managed long term on opioids for chronic pain. And then in terms of, of the risks for overdose, um, evaluating risk factors for each individual patient um, at each follow-up um, is important. Using PDMP to verify or confirm uh, what the patient is telling you. Um, uh, using uh, urine drug screening, avoiding uh, co-prescribing opioids and benzodiazepines, and then offering treatment for opioid use disorder within primary care outpatient settings. So those, this is sort of the pared down version of, of the 12 point plan. Um, but as I pointed out to you uh, throughout the presentation, this is a real paradigm shift for um, uh, how we were treating chronic pain in the past um, and how we are looking at opioids as um, a treatment for chronic pain in the future. Um, and um, this is just a few things um, uh, that I mention to uh, my patients, certainly, um, or friends of mine who know that I do research in opioids, which is to make sure that you're talking to your doctor about all of the options available to you to treat chronic pain, that you are open to trying new evidence-based treatments that maybe you haven't tried in a long time. Um, and this is something that people can bring up to their patients as well, which is, you know, we know now that opioids carry a tremendous risk. And this is something that we did, we're not as aware of prior to now. So what kind of treatments have we tried in the past? And, and can we try them again to see um, if they have some um, if they can offer some relief um, or some improvement in function. Taking an active role in um, decision making and setting your treatment goals. So we know that patients who are actively engaged in their treatment um, do better than patients who are not. So encouraging that um, is important. Monitoring your own progress. This is also really important. I think in general, human beings as we are, we are more aware of um, things that are painful or harmful to us, and we are less aware of times when we are not in pain, right? Like, so we're more aware of, and so the, those kind of um, uh, memories or, or um, notes that we might think about um, uh, carry more weight versus times when um, our pain has been improved. So, so looking at things you know, in a daily or weekly, and getting a sense of, of, of how, how you've been doing um, is important to look at both um, how bad your pain is, but at the same time, how much your pain like has improved and how much your function has improved and what you've been able to do now, perhaps that you wouldn't, weren't doing in the past. Big, big, big important thing is to lock up your supply. Um, we know that um, prescriptions that are written for patients are not just prescriptions that that patient uses. They are, in fact, um, medications that we are sending out into the community. And so it's really, really important, especially to our um, elderly patients, that we are encouraging them to lock up their supply. And again, as I said, never take anyone else's medications or offer to share your medications and refer them to the ER. So it's a very you know, easy thing to do. Well, if your pain is really that bad, then a person should really be evaluated by a healthcare professional, right? Um, you know, that, that is, makes total logical sense. So um, um, patients who might feel pressured um, to 
you know, share their medications with other people, you know, it's very clear. Well, actually, I'm very concerned that if your if your pain is that bad that you feel like you need an opioid, then really you should be evaluated by a healthcare professional. Okay, so what does this mean for um, the Center for Medicare and Medicaid, and how is this related to um, Part D um, uh, beneficiaries? Well, so uh, so as a result of you know all of this, you know national attention on opioid prescribing. In 2013, um, CMS, which is the Center for Medicare and Medicaid, implemented um, a, a, an approach to address opioid overuse in, in Medicare Part D, specifically um, uh, Medicare Part D beneficiaries. And really what they wanted to do is they wanted to create a um, sort of a control or a limit on a point of sale for opioids. So point of sale means when the medication is being dispensed to the patient by the pharmacist. That is what point of sale means for a prescription medication. And um, some of the things that they um, uh, uh, were considering is, is things around safety edits and quantity limits. So for example, if um, I prescribe um, a, high num a high quantity to my patient, then when the pharmacist is actually dispensing that medication, um, he would have to, he or she would have to sort of override that quantity limit by saying, oh, yes, I understand, this is a very high quantity, but this patient needs this medication. So um, they would have to actually respond to that um, uh, alert. Um, uh, and, you know, there's been some talk about whether these safety edits should, in fact, be um, a hard edit versus a soft edit. So a hard edit is actually something where um, there needs to be a, an attestation by the prescriber. So the prescriber would need to actually sign a piece of paper and attest to CMS that, yes, in fact, this patient has this diagnosis that requires either this high dose or this high number of quantity. Um, and so you're like on the record, you know, uh, saying that, you know, we're going to override this um, uh, uh, quantity limit that you've set. Um, and then a soft edit would be something where the pharmacist can just override it at the time when they're dispensing the medication. Um, and, and those are actually different for people who have Medicare Part D and Medicaid. So. I want to make that distinction, is that uh, currently those are actually different. So for people who have Medicare Part D, um, the safety edits are actually soft safety edits, which means that the pharmacist can, in fact, override um, uh, the alert. Um, and so, uh, you know, uh, and as part of this uh, sort of CMS approach to um, uh, opioid overuse is to do a more sort of retrospective review of um, beneficiaries' use of drugs and identify people um, specifically who are called high-risk beneficiaries. So these would be people who are on high-dose therapy or um, uh, um, who have been on medication for um, an extended period of time. And actually, starting in 2018, um, these criteria to identify what actually, um, uh, what, what the criteria are that, that um, define high, a high-risk beneficiary are actually going to change. So I haven't put, it, put them right here, but I'll put them on the next slide, because um, they are, uh, in fact, changing. So if you think you knew what they were, 2018, um, uh, they have actually changed them. And then um, case management with the identified beneficiaries prescribers. So for patients who are actually designated as high-risk beneficiaries, um, prescribers are actually required to do a level of case management for them. Um, and then CMS actually requires that. Um, and then data sharing. So. Part of this CMS approach is to um, um, do data sharing both 
um, from the prescriber side and from the CMS side. Um, and I'll show you a little bit about that on um, the next slide as well. So, uh, so starting in 2018, the criteria that we're going to use to define an opioid overutilizer or a high-risk beneficiary um, uh, have been revised. And um, I'll tell you how. So this is the definition of a high-risk uh, beneficiary. Um, during the most recent six months, um, any uh, beneficiary whose use of opioids with an average daily uh, morphine equivalent dose equal to or exceeding 90 for any duration and um, received opioids from more than three prescribers and more than three pharmacies or more than five prescribers regardless of the number of dispensing pharmacies. So uh, all of these criteria um, uh, represent a high-risk beneficiary. And these parts that I have stored here in green are, are the new revisions. So prior to um, 2018, it was during the most recent year. So they've, they've shortened that duration to six months. And then um, they've also decided to use an average daily MED because that they found that that is a, in the literature um, we are relating that sort of metric um, is a better measure of how much um, opioids that people are actually on. So by, by making it an average daily MED, what you can do is you can account for both short acting and long acting medications because you are sort of um, breaking down everything into morphine equivalent. So as opposed to saying a single prescription, um, you can actually, uh, uh, look at any and all opioids that the patient would take. And what you do is you take an average. And so let's say within a three month period, a person that fills two prescriptions, um, what you can do is you can take those 90 days and you can take those, you know, uh, let's say 60 pills and, and um, you can divide it so that you get an average daily dose. And so what we do, even though during that, let's say three month period, that person takes that medication sporadically, what we can do is we can say, okay, well, in that 90 day period, you know, they, you know, per day, their average daily dose was X amount. Um, and that we can use that as sort of like a cumulative sort of exposure type of a, of a metric. Um, and again, equal to or exceeding 90, and this is again 90 based on the CDC um, recommendation. Um, and then received opioids from more than three prescribers and more than three pharmacies or more than five prescribers regardless of the number of dispensing pharmacies. And this more than five prescribers um, um, regardless of the number of dispensing pharmacies was part of the sort of newer um, um, uh, guidelines to, and this, and this, you know, criteria is, is around a sort of fraud or, or people um, uh, trying to, um, again, get multiple prescriptions from, from multiple um, um, uh, providers. And, and I'll explain a little bit about, you know, fraud and, and how that sort of plays into this um, uh, in the next slide. Um, beneficiaries with cancer or hospice are excluded, so um, uh, those patients are not considered under this high-risk beneficiary definition of an opioid overutilization. They also uh, changed um, their uh, definition of um, prescribers. So this sort of single TIN is just an identifier um, given to a, um, a group practice. So for example, if I you know, go to uh, a group practice where there are, you know, let's say five different um, providers, um, I could see any of those five providers who could in fact refill my prescription. And that doesn't make it a new prescription, right? Or it sort of, they, they wanted to be able to, to encapsulate that. I want to be able to capture that um, uh, better so that um, they weren't picking out people who were getting all these multiple prescribers um, uh, because they were just going to the same group practice. So they, they, they put that in um, uh, for that reason. 
And then party sponsor, so I work for Kaiser Permanente, so Kaiser Permanente would be a party sponsor, which is just um, a healthcare system that accepts party. Um, they're required to provide quarterly reports on these high-risk beneficiaries and to provide CMS with the outcome of their review of each case. So this is really, um, um, you know, cracking down on patients who are in this um, uh, uh, in this category of high-risk beneficiaries. And really, you know, the motivation is to have patients not be in this. Um, uh, high-risk uh, beneficiary um, category. And in more to come, so I know we just started 2018, but in 2019, um, CMS will, will, will also do more to um, uh, change things um, uh, around, and this is really around prescribers um, who are enrolled in, in, in Medicare. So, um, uh, starting in 2019, uh, myself as a Medicare Part D opioid prescriber, the CMS will have a file on me, right? And that file um, will present the information on my prescribing rates. Um, and so um, CMS will be able to track that. There will also be uh, a quarterly pharmacy risk assessment, which is going to actually categorize specific pharmacies as high, medium, or low risk in terms of their um, opioid dispensing. So again, this is, this is again, more focused on this reducing fraud um, uh, of Medicare or abuse of, of Medicare. Um, and this is, this is, all of these kind of initiatives were the result of, of some um, re reports or some um, uh, some reviews that were done by the Office of Accountability Inspector General that showed that, in fact, you know, people were getting prescribed, you know, vast amounts of of medication um, or prescribers that were just, you know, large and large amounts of, of prescriptions, and and that those. Um, prescriptions or those medications were then being illegally distributed. So um, uh, some of these and a lot of these have, have to do with um, reducing that fraud, but at the same time sort of improving the medication safety. So, um, so again, pharmacies will be categorized. Uh, prescriber risk assessment, which provides a peer comparison. So um, as a Medicare Part D prescriber, I will be able to see how my prescribing rates compare to someone in the practice, you know, next to me or in the next town or et cetera, um, uh, so that we can compare those. There's also a TRIO prescriber initiative to identify providers who prescribe this combination therapy that I talked about that was so dangerous. And then again, something called a pill mill doctor project, which is, again, sort of very specifically focused um, on uh, prescribers where, you know, the risk of fries is very, very high um, and, you know, no number of patients could possibly, you know, meet the number of prescriptions that are written for um, by that particular prescriber. So sort of competing priorities here for CMS, which is, you know, to improve, not competing, but concurrent, which is to improve medication safety and um, um, reduce the fraud um, and provide some more supervision and monitoring. Um, because as I showed at the very beginning to sort of full circle, right? Um, is that the opioid prescribing was out of control, has gotten out of control um, in a very short amount of time, uh, from 1990s, you know, to 2010, right? So that's a short amount of time to have a huge increase in the number of opioid prescriptions. So um, oversight is necessary, and um, CMS will be providing that oversight for, for Medicare Part D um, beneficiaries, um, which are, again, 80% of those people are people who are older than 65. So this is the end of my talk. Um, uh, if there are any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Uh, yes? Yes, I'll repeat it. Yes. I will read you some questions from the chat box, too. So if you want to ask 
Oh, great. Uh, right. So that's a very good point. Um, so in terms of a lower age group, uh, do you mean like ages, like Oh, 65. Right. So, so um, the question was, um, uh, what do I consider the age limit um, for older adults? And um, specifically, it's um, 65 and up is what I've been referring to. And then the second question was about um, uh, the first recommendation, which was opioids are not the first line therapy. So what are the non-opioid, non-pharmacologic, I believe the question was, right? Non-pharmacologic um, methods that um, are recommended. So. Um, the evidence that we have on non-pharmacologic um, uh, methods, which are, you know, a lot of them refer to sort of complementary therapies, um, uh, like acupuncture or yoga or um, tai chi or physical therapy or all of these other things, um, uh, have shown that have shown some moderate, sort of, sort of like moderate effect, right, in terms of improving people's pain. But those are like population level aggregate, you know, sort of studies that we do. And individuals might experience um, more or less effect depending on that person's, you know, motivation to do the treatment and to follow through on the treatment, as well as, you know, their own sort of pain process. So I think that, um, unfortunately, it, it is kind of a process to figure out which kind of treatment is going to work for which patient. And that we don't actually, we can't predict that very well at the start. Um, and that it, 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 it kind of has to be, you know, a trial and error type of a um, um, uh, process with with individual patients. Yes. Absolutely, yeah, and and uh, the comment was about um, the sort of disconnect between, um, um, you know, the sort of access or ease of access to prescription medications versus like the effort and time and money that are associated with these non-pharmacologic um, uh, methods, and that you know the evidence that we have is not very strong that. Um, these alternative methods are in fact effective. And we, we don't have good evidence to suggest that we can predict which, which type of treatment is going to work for, for, for which patient. Um, but, um, uh, you know, that we are, we are currently working on that. Um, you know, that's, that's like the direction that um, I think pain research is, is moving towards um, is, is doing a better job of understanding what works for which patients. Covered. Absolutely. So the question, uh, the, 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 the comment was that physical therapy um, isn't the same as a complementary therapy. Um, absolutely. Uh, that physical therapy is 
a non-opioid, non-pharmacologic treatment um, uh, that we recommend or we can refer patients, um, and that would, in fact, be covered a lot of times. Um, uh, uh, so that that's definitely an option. So um, I've got some questions that came up earlier. So um, one of them, you've dealt with a lot, but let me know if you want to say anything more about other treatments for people instead of opioids to deal with pain. Say about that. Um, do Do you want me to repeat? It? Yeah. Okay. That's okay. Um, so the question was um, um, other treatments uh, besides opioids. Um, uh, what other treatments are available? And, and we were just talking about that. Um, and like I said, the the I think the most important thing is to get the patient to buy into putting effort, time, and effort into their treatment. Um, so honestly, it's the thing that the patient actually wants to do and is willing to continue to do. Um, those are a lot of, that drives a lot of your sort of clinical decision making or your approach towards the patient is, you know, it doesn't make sense for me to recommend something that they don't want to do or they never want to do or they hate doing, right? That's not going to work. Um, so. It's really about shared decision making with the patient, figuring out, okay, this is something that appeals to them that they are willing to do and follow through with. Let's start from there um, and, and, and go, because it, in reality, we don't really know what's going to work for what patient. Mazula is asking, could you please go into more depth about the use of naltrexone, the rationale, et cetera, of using this drug long term? So naltrexone, yeah. So so that's a good question. So naltrexone is another sort of medication-assisted treatment for um, uh, um, opioid use disorder, and it comes in two forms. It comes in uh, uh, a you know a pill that you would have to take every day versus an injection that you would take once a month. And um, so the evidence isn't great. Um, uh, uh, for naltrexone either um, as a long-term treatment for um, uh, opioid use disorder. I think that, you know, the evidence is much stronger for medications like Suboxone um, uh, and methadone maintenance as far as maintaining sobriety over time. I think that naltrexone for some patients can be an effective way to uh, you know, reduce use like within a short amount of time. Like, like if, I mean, there are some treatments, again, abstinence kind of treatments are less effective. And that's what the evidence suggests, is that abstinence type of treatments are less effective. And naltrexone is in effect the same, the same thing. Um, because it doesn't actually, you know, um, like suboxone or methadone, it doesn't actually do anything to the opioid receptor, right? So, so there isn't, you know, the same kind of an effect. Um, uh, so, you know, although there have been some patients who I've had who've, you know, maintained sobriety for, you know, a number of months um, using injectable naltrexone. So, I guess it's working with the patient to figure out what you know, treatment they feel most comfortable with. There's a lot of patients who think that, oh, well, I don't want to do a replacement therapy because now I'm just addicted to methadone as opposed to addicted to opioids, or now I'm addicted to Suboxone as opposed to being addicted to opioids. So, you know, it's a potential um, uh, treatment, you know, that you can use with those patients. But um, again, the evidence is that medications like Suboxone and Methadone are more effective. So Sally from Sound Generations is sort of saying, why do we have these dangerous drugs out there? Drug company is big question mark. Is there anything good about opioids? So that's a good question. Um, I think that, um, hmm? oh, I'm sorry. The question was, um, is there anything good about opioids because of all of these things that I've been talking about? And, you know, opioids, used in very specific situations can be a very effective. So, so you know, for example, like if we do a very serious surgery on someone, we have an effect, cause them a lot of physical, you know, damage. And so their body 
is going to experience a lot of pain. And so, you know, helping them through that, you know, in a post-operative, you know, situation in a controlled sort of hospital environment, I think, is um, an appropriate use of that medication. And as long as you can instruct a patient to taper themselves off of opioids um, and that this isn't going to be a long-term treatment, that that is clear, um, uh, then it can be used effectively as well as, you know, in acute, in very acute pain situations. Um, as far as opioids as a treatment for long-term chronic pain, um, you know, my personal opinion is that it will not we, we will not be able to continue to prescribe this medication because of the number of deaths. Um, so from, I think it's just a matter of time until we stop doing that altogether. But it will take a while for us to get there. Um, uh, but the risks are, 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 are high, and that, and that is a, a very valid point. So, so absolutely correct that if only a few providers have the ability to prescribe, that those providers are in fact inundated, right, with those patients and their entire practice can somehow be, be taken over. How, so, so the whole point is that we share, you know, all of those patients and that we increase access to that kind of treatment. And the certification to get this type of um, prescription, prescribing authority, um, um, uh, you know, there's education um, that you're supposed to go through to be able to get that. Um, and, you know, I mean, it's, it's, it's a valid point. There are, there are a lot of providers who are afraid to get this kind of prescriptive authority because they don't want their practice to be inundated. Um, but in the end, I mean, we all have to sort of share share all of these patients. Um, you know, but there's no, there's no, there's no, that is a very good point. I mean, there's no real answer to that, that question. You're, you know, it, it's a conundrum, you know, that we're that we're currently in, where we we are in a bit of a you know bottleneck here, you know, and you know uh, until until all of these residents who are now getting you know prescriptive authority start you know being pumped out into the system, um, it it is going to be a few providers sort of you know doing the doing the majority of the work. Yes, there is, and there are dosing calculators that are available online. So, um, uh, oh yes, so the question was about um, looking at MME um, uh, and um, calculating that across different prescribing. And, and absolutely, there are opioid dosing calculators that are available that um, pers prescribers can use. Um, I know that we have one through Washington State uh, Department of Health website. Sure, um, uh, but they are easily available. You can Google it, opioid dosing calculator, and you'll get a variety of, of, of different ones. And you can just type in the type of opioid that you're looking for, and there'll be all kinds of um, um, reference charts as well. But it's best to, to type it into the calculator because each patient has a different dose. So you can actually you know, sum all the different medications that they're on, right? So if they're on a long-acting and a short-acting, you want to make sure you're counting all of it. So the question is, is there a risk that we will be swinging the pendulum uh, the other way and not controlling people's pain again? And, and that, as I mentioned, that 
is the main argument against putting limits on opioid prescribing, which is what about the treatment for pain? And that is also a very valid point to think about. Um, I think that what has happened, in effect, is that we have sort of taken what we know about acute pain and tried to translate that into chronic pain, which is not a good, which was flawed, I think, right? So, so, so thinking about pain as like the fifth vital sign makes sense in an acute setting where you're checking people's pain every so many hours, um, you know, and so then you can track it over time, right? But in a chronic pain situation, it's a different conversation to be talking about, you know, how that person's pain influences their life and their daily activities. It's not the same thing. And so I think that part of this whole movement of these recommendations is, again, to say chronic pain is something different. It is not acute pain. We should be thinking about it differently and assessing it differently. and and you know, yeah, there, there, there's always a risk of, 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 you know, I think people feeling like, well, okay, if I don't have opioids, then what do I have, right? And, and that's really where I think it is the responsibility of all of us to become educated on what resources are available to patients and accessible to patients in our areas and where we can refer patients um, and how, how, how best we can educate ourselves to treat patients that way. But, you know, it is, it is absolutely a, um, a good point um, uh, about the pendulum swinging and being careful about that. Yes, so there's this muscle relaxant opioid uh, 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 connection. It's like, it, it's a specific one. I think it's called, um, uh, it's like carb, um, what is it called? Um, hmm? uh, no, it's called, um, um, gosh, it starts with a C-A-R. I'm trying to remember the name of a specific, it's a specific muscle relaxant um, uh, that, um, ha when it breaks down, it breaks down into an opioid derivative. Um, so what happens is that it does, in fact, like um, uh, uh, promulgate or, or um, potentiate, right, the effect of opioids. So there is a it's, a, it's about a specific muscle relaxant um, uh, that, that has an, an, an opioid derivative. And I'll, I'll think about it. It's Soma. It's Soma. That's the brand name of it. Soma is the brand name. I don't, I can't remember at the moment the the the, the um, generic name, but that's the brand name. Billy says, as a family medicine residency, we have multiple providers without DEAs who are primary providers for patients who may receive controlled substances. A different supervising provider may be signing these prescriptions at different visits. Does this situation fall under the TIN you mentioned? So, how do we find out what our TIN is? Okay, um, so the question is about um, uh, patients whose prescriptions are being co-signed, right, by um, a supervising, let's say supervising physicians or supervising people, um, uh, and sort of, you know, how are those prescriptions being counted in this um, system that CMS has and using this sort of TIN. So I would actually refer you to the um, um, uh, the CMS website um, uh, to, to help um, um, guide you towards the right um, information on that. I think um, um, my understanding is that this number represents a group practice. So if you are all under the same group practice, then that should be um, represented. And again, this is about like Part D sponsor, right? So, so if your whole practice, um, so it's not like a federal DEA thing, right? Like it's, it's about a Part, part D. So 
if your whole practice is a Part D sponsor, which means you accept Part D, Medicare Part D, um, uh, you know, type of uh, uh, insurance. So some of them are providers without DEAs, but their prescriptions, so therefore their prescriptions are not written by those providers. They're written by other prescribers, right? right? Within the practice, right? right. Who are not necessarily right there. Who are not necessarily right there. So in that case, I mean, the prescriber who's signing the, the, the prescription is responsible for all those prescriptions. And um, if there are any patients who meet this category of high-risk beneficiary, then they would be identified as such um, if they are covered by Part D. So um, a t this number is really meant to, um, uh, it's meant to sort of remove the, the kind of sort of false positive that you might find for patients who are getting sort of multiple prescribers, right? So they have this thing now where it's five prescribers regardless of the number of pharmacies that you go to. But if you are in the same practice and there are five prescribers in the same practice, right, and you happen to get a refill from a different prescriber, you know, whatever, that that it doesn't like pop up as, oh, you're a high risk person because you're getting all these different prescriptions from different prescribers. So it's not really like, a, again, it's not a DEA thing. Um, it's, it's really about like, you know, patients getting prescriptions from all different people. Um, um, and again, if, 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 the, if the persons, you know, who are recommending this medication to somebody to prescribe, even though they don't have a DEA, then again, it's the responsibility of that person. And you know, if you're all under the same practice, then you're all under the same practice. So, um, what do you do with anyone who refuses to decrease the opioid use? Very good, very good question. I'm so glad that that um, is brought up. So, right. Um, oh, oh, I'm sorry. The question was. Uh, now you're all in suspense about what the great question was. <laughs> but <laughs> the question was, um, what do you do with patients who don't want to decrease their dose? So this is a common problem, right? This is not an unusual problem. And, you know, there is a, um, you know, certainly in our practice where I am at Kaiser Permanente Washington, we talk about these legacy patients, right? So these patients that you inherit from other providers who have been prescribed high dose therapy or high quality, high therapies for very many years and you feel uncomfortable as a prescriber to continue this therapy, um, but you've just inherited this patient now who's been on this for a long time. Well, I mean, unfortunately, right, it, it, it is a situation where you have to um, confront the patient with the recent evidence, right? And it's also important to think about, you know, what the patient's risks are versus the benefits of their treatment, right? So if a patient says, well, you know, my pain is terrible, right? And they're being prescribed high dose therapy, right? Then, you know, they're not doing well on, but they're carrying all this risk, right? So, so I mean, that doesn't really make sense. Um, and if patients say, "I'm doing really well," you know, on this, you know, opioid treatment, and and um, you know, I've been managed on this opioid treatment for for a very long time, and I've never had any problems. I mean, you know, it's it's important to weigh the risks and benefits for each patient. Um, and, you know, it, it ultimately it is important, I think that you do have to confront them on the more recent evidence. I, I wish I had like a, you know, um, a uh, better answer, but um, uh, yes, you, you, you have to be confrontational and you have to suggest that, listen, risks here are greater than the harms. and, and you know that that that's 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 not that's not that's that's not okay. You know. I just got distracted. I just got a message from somebody I used to know in Alaska. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I go to the next one. Fairbanks um, from CMS. Quote: The PICOS data include a group or an individual provider organizational 
tax ID number, which identifies the business with the IRS and their national provider identifier, which identifies the business or provider within the healthcare system, along with other information. The MPI is unique to a prescriber and is required to be submitted on every Part D claim, but you're right. Prescribers that work within the same practice should have the same TIN, therefore we group the MPIs and PICOs that have the exact same single TIN and count the group as one provider. So you could just sort of say, got the close Oh, so, um, so we got some uh, really great information that um, uh, from, um, where was it, Burbank? Yes? Billings? Billings. Oh, that's fine. Burbank. Fairbanks, we got some really great information about um, uh, the TIN number and how um, uh, it is used to uh, define a, a group practice um, versus an NPI number. So an NPI number is an individual identify number versus this TIN number, which represents an entire practice. So um, um, uh, that that was the that was the gist of of, of that um, information, um, but. That was a, a, a good information if we can include that um, uh, quote for in the in the presentation for other for, for, for people listening later. We're having a lot of activity on the chat, so uh, uh, that's. I think that's it for the questions that I have in the chat room. If you have other questions, I just have one. I just feel like we need to. There's going to be expectations that need to be changed of like what, even like after post-operative pain, you know, you're going to have some, and you know, I, I think some of the chronic users start as the post-operative users, so. I, I think the expectation that with this, it's such a great time to make, help society change. Like you're not going to not have pain. I don't know what you think, but yeah, that was sort of the comment was about um, post-operative pain and changing patients' expectations around the pain that they're going to experience post-operatively, and talking about how patients post-op might transition into long-term use. Um, uh, and those are all good points, yeah. And, and yes, it's really important that we, as providers or, you know, as people, you know, that, that, we, that we all as a society uh, here in the United States certainly um, start to accept the fact that having surgery means that you will be in some level of pain. And that ha being pain-free is, is not something that you should expect. Um, uh, as a result, after you've had a very serious surgery, right? Um, uh, and that—that's a this, that's that's a, a a change, right? Like that's definitely a a, a shift in 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 the thinking. Um, uh, so hopefully, I think that is the kind of goal of some of these prescribing guidelines is is to set these sort of realistic expectations for patients. Um, uh, but post-op patients are, are definitely, um, uh, you know, particularly high risk, um, uh, you know, for a lot of reasons, but they're particularly high risk um, because they are, you know, experiencing a lot of pain and also getting, you know, prescription opioids. Um, so making sure that all of your post-op patients have very clear taper plans is very, very important um, uh, and that they understand, you know, withdrawal symptoms and what they might experience um, as a result of withdrawal symptoms uh, is important. Is there, are, do we have any further questions or shall we, we are, we are done. Well, thank you very much for the opportunity to present and um, uh, I'm happy to accept any further questions by email. Um, uh, so if anyone um, listening has any other questions, feel free to email me um, and I'll uh, make my email available. So thank you very much.